And so, no, when I came in this morning, it was raining. It was not a Presbyterian rain, it was a Baptist rain. How so? What's the difference? <laughs> I'm telling you what. You know, no sprinkling. This was a dunking, right? I got, I give you that. That's a good one. I've never heard that before. A Baptist rain. I, I was communicating with a friend this morning, and I'm telling you what. I, 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 the, the crux of the conversa- conversation was that I recommended wearing scuba gear today, because I'm telling you what, it's coming down. So, absolutely. Well, cool beans. How is everybody this morning besides damp? I said, how is everybody this morning besides damp? So, excellent. Excellent. You know, it, it is a good thing. We're ready for sunshine where we are. We, we, um, and it's, the only thing I lament is that we didn't get the corn in the ground prior to all of this rain, um, just for germination and such. But I'm waiting on some non-GMO, non-hybrid seed to get to me so that we can um, plant something that's not pesticide-coated. For those who were South Carolina, they won a national championship Did they? Yes, the equestrian program at USC is fantastic. Um, fantastic, and they've done that more than once, haven't they? I know they've got a really good equestrian program. So, I tell you what, I I follow almost no sports, and I, I've got my favorite team, but it's just no time. Not enough time in the day. That's coming down, Jeremiah and I are talking and I'm ticking off the different things that I want to be doing and um, I wish there were you know, about five more hours <laughs> in the day. So anyway, let's open with a word of prayer. And you know what? I tell you what, it's uh, I I understand the sentiment, um, but I'm already down to like about five hours of sleep on average a night, and would love to, and twelve twelve and a half hours a day at work, and so that I mean that really kind of kind of puts a crimp in it, but it is what it is. God is good. Let's open with a word of prayer. Ah, but we do thank you for this day, and we thank you for the rain that we have continued to receive, and we just pray that you would use that. Um, to fill the ponds and to um, prepare seed and prepare the gardens and everybody's uh, things that they're growing. And we thank you. We look forward to the sunshine this week and we thank you as the weather's warming up um, just for the portent of spring and all that comes with it. Um, We ask now for this time that you would um, guide us, that you would teach us, that you would instruct us as we look into your word. I pray, Abba, that you would Use my lips and that you would bring, uh, bring to us truth as we look into your word and consider um, what we read in the history of the early believers in the Mashiach and what they did. <clears throat> and so, Abba, we ask that you would lead and guide us in that regard. We pray this in the name of our Messiah, Beshem Yeshua, Meshikanu, Sar Shalom. Amen. Uh, that is on. Yes, I do have. I've got everything on here. Um, and y'all are going to see, I guess, the whole deal up there on the screen. I had trouble last week with some glitching, and I'm going to try to see if I can use my a little bit of PowerPoint. But really, what, what most of the PowerPoint is just a list of references, and so we're going to spend a whole lot of time with eSword and just looking at Scripture and talking about what Scripture says. And so some of that, in fact, I can probably blow that up so that you can see a little bit better. I see Connie squinting. Is that better for you? Easier on the eyes? And of course, as we talk about the, the, the various references, you have a Bible in hand, and I recommend that you follow along with yours so that you can verify that what I've got up here is the same thing as what you've got in yours. Um, and, we'll, uh, and, and we'll go that route. Um, <clears throat> so let me see just for a second if, if, uh, if I can make the PowerPoint do what I want it to do. See, my mouse is glitching, so I may shut down the PowerPoint. Here's the question. We want to consider, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to consider the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is um, the one that everybody points to, one way or another. You know, 
And ultimately, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Messiah. The question is, was, was the Apostle Paul a schizophrenic liar that on one hand says the law is good and by faith we establish the law and somewhere else he says you're no longer under the law and we've done away with it and it's all gone? Or was the Apostle Paul misunderstood? By that I mean, um, have we historically taken his words out of context? And we'll talk a little bit more about context later, but we're going to begin establishing context today in terms of how the Apostle Paul did. Now, um, my father uh, went home to be with the Lord in 1998, but when I was growing up, a word or phrase, a, a statement that I heard him say over and over and over, and this, this was the, these were the dreaded words when he was correcting, is what you do speaks so loud I can hardly hear what you say. What you do speaks so loud I can hardly hear what you say. And there are many variations on that. He may have gotten that somewhere else, but I know he used that all the time. Um, but we hear other variations on it. Let your life be a book that preaches, right? What you do speaks so loud I can hardly hear what you say. Or um, Chaplain Brown relayed one to me that he's had on his, uh, on his board for years. Now I put you on the none, spot. None preaches as loud as the ant who says nothing. None preaches as loud as the ant who says nothing. And, and what's the lesson we learn from the ant? We just learned this work ethic. Um, and so what I'm going to do, because we're just going to be going through references, is I'm going to shut down the... Um, PowerPoint that I had just in case it, um, it, it was what was causing my glitching last week. And we are going to walk through reference after reference after reference this week, and we're going to establish what Paul did. Scripture is filled. In fact, the book of Acts. Um, I, I can remember that when I first came into the Messianic and I was wrestling with Paul, what, what I did, here's what I did initially. I set Paul aside. I said, I don't even understand this guy all of a sudden because everything he says seems to contradict what the rest of the book says. And we're told that the whole thing fits together and that all the pieces come together. And then we're told that Paul said this and we don't have to do that. And so for me, I took Paul and I set him aside for a period of time while I considered what Yeshua did and said and while I considered what Scripture says is the everlasting, unchanging Word of God that we're blessed by, or ble we're blessed by Him when we are obedient to it. And then I came back to look at Paul, and where I started is where we're going to start today. And that is going to the book of Acts and reading the book of Acts carefully. The book of Acts is a wonderful history. It's a document that tells us exactly what they did in the early church. And part of my reason for going to the book of Acts was because one of the questions in my mind um, some years ago is what did the early church look like? Because for me, it was becoming a problem. I was standing in the pulpit. Our congregation was, was, wasn't growing the way I thought it should grow, and it wasn't reacting the way I thought it should react. And I said, why? And ultimately, the question that came to me is, are we doing what scripture says. Are we doing what they did in the book of Acts? And once I started studying that, I realized, you know what? This is not that in many, many respects. And, and it challenged me. And so that's what we'll do today is we will be challenged, but we're really going to be looking at the apostle Paul and what the apostle Paul did. <clears throat> um, so let's begin with... Uh, Let's begin with Sabbath. Let's look at the Apostle Paul's... Well, let me, let me do something else first. I had a couple other slides on there and I already closed them up. And I, for that, I apologize now that I think about it. Uh, I want to say that my references were in um, Philippians before we went to Acts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What did I have there? Because I didn't write them down on my sheet. Well, we're not going to go there. We'll just go straight to the book of Acts, and what we're going to do is we'll, we'll consider the Apostle Paul. What, uh, uh, and the references that I, that I was pointing at or wanted to point to initially 
is Paul talking about his background and talking about the fact that he was born as a uh, born as a Jew. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. His father was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. He was trained by Gam, uh, Gamaliel, the the premier um, rabbi at that time. He w- in, in fact, his writings and the things that he said are still connected to much of um, the foundational documents for Judaism. Paul was steeped in the Torah. He was steeped in the um, traditions of his fathers. He was, if you had cut him, he would have bled Hebrew, Torah, so on and so forth. And so we have to understand to begin with, at least that's where he was before he met the Mashiach um, and was knocked off of his donkey on the way to um, Damascus. And so we already talked about Acts chapter 9 from the perspective that your Bible, the heading probably says the conversion of Saul or the conversion of Paul. And yet nowhere in the passage of Scripture does it ever say that he converted to anything. It says that he met the Messiah. And then ultimately in Acts chapter, I've got my Bible over here because I've got all the highlights and stuff and that helps me. Ultimately, it tells us in Acts chapter 22, uh, as he's relaying the story down around verse 12, it says, One Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which, which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. The point being that the person who came and by the Spirit removed the scales from Paul's eyes was a Torah keeper, believer in Messiah. He was obedient to the law. It tells us that right here in the book of Acts. And so we're going to see all these little phrases, all these little details that point to that. So what was Paul's practice as he began to go out to preach? What was his practice? Let's begin in Acts chapter 13, verse um, Acts chapter 13, verse 14. And I've gone through and, and added some highlights in advance of everything here. I guess you didn't get the chair you wanted. Um, <laughs> I saw that hesitation, like, whoa. Okay. Um, here we go. We're considering the actions of, of Paul the Apostle. What did Paul do? My father, when, uh, when we were growing up, always said, what you do speaks so loud I can hardly hear what you say. And we talk about what Paul said. What did Paul do to establish the context in which we can begin to understand what Paul said? Um, Acts chapter 13, verse 14. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And what we're going to see as we look through the book of Acts is that Paul taught on the Sabbath. He taught on the Sabbath. He taught on the Sabbath. It was running. I thought it was. It was. Uh, That's okay. Hopefully we've got a good audio here. Okay. Um, He taught on the Sabbath. And he taught on the Sabbath. And he taught on the Sabbath. Um, And we're going to see this as we look through the scriptures. Acts chapter... 13, verse 42. We scroll on down. And remember, at this point, Acts chapter 13, the um, Messiah has been risen and has been gone for probably about 10 years at this point. Uh, Something of that nature. Acts chapter 13, verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, I have a question. Why are the Gentiles asking to be taught on the Sabbath? Why didn't Paul just say, hey, I'll meet you guys tomorrow because that's the day for you? That's not what he did. He says, come back next Shabbat. I'll see you next Shabbat. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, uh, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Continue in what? I think this is roughly 10 years after. That's what I'm 10 plus. 
is what we're looking at. Is, is, is that about right? Is that about what you would guesstimate? I think, I think scholars would guesstimate that it's about 10 years. Because even after Paul's conversion, which was, um, and I use the word conversion because that's what we're familiar with. But we already addressed the fact that Paul, can, he, he, the word never appears in scripture related to Paul. He didn't convert to something. We'll address that in a few minutes. Um, but the point is, is when Paul came to know the Messiah from that point forward, there was a period of time that he went to, um, to Arabia and spent a period of time in study. Some years, it looks like. That he was gone to Arabia and his, his coming to the Messiah did not happen right away. It happened sometime after um, Stephen's martyrdom. And Stephen's martyrdom didn't happen right away. That happened some um, many months to maybe even a couple years after the resurrection of the Messiah. So uh, Acts chapter 13 verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Paul teaching on the Shabbat. Okay? Let's proceed to Acts chapter 16, verse 13. And on the Sabbath, he went out of the city by a riverside um, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which uh, resorted thither. This is... Uh, and we're looking at the King James. We're looking at the KJ. Uh, here's the point. The Sabbath rolls around. Apparently the city didn't have a synagogue. Where is he going to go? He's going to go to where believers are meeting so that he can sit down and they can worship together. They can pray. They can talk. He can teach. So on and so forth. He's teaching on the Sabbath. He's not doing something else that day and now worshiping the next. Chapter 17, verse 2. 17, verse 2. And Paul, as his manner or custom was, uh, I'm going to guess the word is custom, um, particular place down uh, concerning, looking to see if the word custom appears there. But as his manner was, went into them and three Sabbath days, Three weeks on every Shabbat for three weeks. Reasoned with them out of the scriptures. He's teaching on the Shabbat. Okay. Uh, 18.4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Where were the Greeks? Where were the Gentiles? In the synagogue. They were in the synagogue. Now, I want to take you back to another verse that will validate that for us if we go to Acts chapter 15. Now, we're going to spend some time maybe in a couple weeks looking specifically at Acts chapter 15 because this is a passage that is often misunderstood. But particularly, the question in Acts chapter 15 is whether or not you need to be circumcised to be saved. It is not a question of whether or not we have to keep the Torah. Watch. Because we get down toward, uh, uh, after they have this discussion, and we'll go through this discussion later on, but I want to, just want to demonstrate something for you here. Um, James, uh, let's see, right here. After they held their peace, James, uh, the name is Jacob, and he's the half-brother of Yeshua, and he is um, the Nasi, he's the head of the the believers he's the one that they look to for the final ruling he's essentially the chief judge he's fulfilling the role of if you will the high priest or the leader of the sanhedrin and what he does is he answers and he says men and brethren listen to me and then he says um or, or some translation will say this is my um decision and he proceeds to lay out for them exactly what's supposed to happen. And he begins by explaining that the prophet said that the Gentiles would come in. And now we understand how they come in through the Messiah. They come in to be part of Israel, to restore the tent of David. Amos chapter 9, um, verse 11. That's a nice, easy one to remember. Amos 9, 11 and following, right? And, uh, and he explains that. And then he says, this is my sentence. That we trouble not them which come from among the Gentiles who are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, 
from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. And we'll talk about those four things because those four things are all directly connected with pagan practices in the temple. He's not saying these are the only things they have to do. He's saying this is what you've got to do. This is what the Gentiles need to do to be cleaned up to come into fellowship. And we'll, we'll look at this in more detail later. But then he says this is why. He says, if they will do those four things to be cleaned up to come into fellowship, they then can learn, he says, for Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. His expectation was that the Gentile believers would learn Moses in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Right? And Paul, remember, Paul is at this meeting. What he's teaching is what has, has in many respects, sparked this con uh, controversy with those of the um, Pharisee element that say, no, they've got to be circumcised and they've got to um, keep all of the oral traditions, essentially, is the way it was. They were looking for proselyte conversion, right? And we're going to talk about that. We're going to get to that in a week or two. But here's the point. Paul is doing exactly what this says. He's teaching Moses. Remember, and I, I, we'll, we'll hit this multiple times. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, he says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for doctrine and for training in righteousness and for reproof and for... What's the other one? There's four points. I can't remember the other one. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. The point being... When Paul's talking about all scripture, he's not talking about his personal letters. In fact, most of the gospels at that point had not even been written. And Paul's letters are just encyclicals. They're letters being passed around. He's talking about the Tanakh. He's talking about the Torah. He's, that's the scripture he's talking about. And he says that is profitable for instruction and righteousness, for doctrine, for reproof, and for, uh, for training. Right? And so he concurs right here. And James says, Moses is what they're going to learn, and they're going to learn it in the synagogues, and they're going to learn it every Sabbath day. Okay? So, I want to point out that, um, that Paul taught on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath. In fact, there's not a single instance in Scripture of him teaching any other day. Let me take you one place that often everybody says, see? Let's go look at it. Acts chapter 20 verse 7. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. We'll come back to Acts chapter 20, verse 6 in a minute. Right here in your Bible, it says, and on the first day of the week when the disciples were together, right? Came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue his speech until midnight. There are several distinct problems with translating this as meaning Sunday. And so we need to look at this um, to start with. This is the only place in Scripture that even comes remotely close to talking about Sunday. To start with, we have to understand that this is, these are, it's, a, it's a, written from a Jewish perspective. And everything's practiced from a Hebraic perspective. And everything that they do is based on Hebraic perspective and based on the Torah. And the day begins at sunset. Did you know that? The evening and the morning were the first day. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And with, in, uh, in Judaism and in Scripture, always the day begins at sunset. The day ends at sunset. Shabbat begins Friday evening. We wait and we have dinner as the sun is going down. And we say that, sing the Shema. And we um, break the challah. And we share... Um, uh, some wine or some juice and we sing the praises of our king and then we gather around the table and we enter into rest as the sun goes down. And Shabbat begins. The Sabbath day begins by our calendar Friday evening around 6 or 7 or 8 o'clock depending on when the sun goes down. And it is Shabbat until Saturday evening about the time that sun goes down. And every fellowship that I know that meets on Saturday has an oneg. They have a meal after the Shabbat. They get together. We, we eat at Issachar. 
It's usually very light finger foods because we don't really have a full kitchen at the place that, 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 we're, uh, that we're blessed with having. The point is, is they met on the Shabbat and then they had food to break bread around sunset. And then you've got a good speaker in town and he's leaving tomorrow morning. He's uh, going to be on a jet plane. Well, it's going to be a boat. Um, and... So they're going to they're gonna continue to ply his ear. They want to keep learning from him. And so Saturday evening, according to the Gregorian calendar, after they finish eating, the first day of the week, according to the Hebraic calendar, in the evening portion, they keep on going. How do I know that? Let's look at this. The Hebrew phrase here, did you know that day doesn't show up in this? It's supplied. You see this right here? That word right there, that's supplied by the translators. The word day doesn't even show up in the passage. Week often is not necessarily used that way. In fact, there are only nine times in Scripture, and I can't find anywhere in extra-biblical writing that the word miaton sabaton means first day of the week anywhere outside of Scripture. In fact, mia generally should be translated not as First, but as one, as one of. Yeah. There was one of. Or a certain, a specific day of the week. Not as, because Luke, the author here, knows what first day of the week means. Because if you slide down to verse 16, he says, right, 16 or 19. Let me look at my notes in my Bible here. Chapter 20. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 18. It's come to them the first day, um, right there, and it's proto hamara, not miaton sabaton. He uses an entirely different phrase to make that, make that description right there. So I, it's, I, on my blog, and I, it's, because of glitching, I didn't pull that up on here uh, today, but I've got a whole article going through and saying, you know what, there are a lot of other possibilities and a bunch of hurdles to get over this verse in uh, Acts chapter 20 to say that that means um, that that means Sunday. It doesn't. And there's no place in Scripture ever that we have any example of Paul teaching on Sunday during the day. There's not one single example. There's no example in Scripture of, of Christians meeting on that day. Or those who believed in the Messiah. It does say they met every day. But the day that they kept was the Shabbat. And that's what we consistently see Paul teaching on is the Shabbat. The seventh day Sabbath. So, what did Paul do? And that's what we're, what, that's what we're establishing. What did Paul do? What you do speaks so loud I can hardly hear what you say. Right? The feasts. Did Paul keep the feasts? We have evidence of that. In fact, we have one of the evidences right here. Acts chapter 20, verse 6. And we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in, in five days where we bowed seven days. What is that right there? It's a timing marker. It's a, it's a little snippet of information that's tossed in. It's something that's entirely unimportant if we don't need to keep those days. But it's very important as a detail for the timing of when he's traveling and everything else if we're keeping those days. Right there. Acts chapter 20, verse 6. Another example in this same chapter, verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend time in Asia. For he haste, if it were possible, for him to be at Yerushalayim the day of Shavuot. Pentecost. Why would he be bypassing people and he's rushing to Jerusalem to be there for Pentecost? Why? Because the Torah says you're to, you're, you're to come before me in the temple three times per year at, at Pesach, at Shavuot, and at Sukkot. And it was one of those times. And there were other times that, that Scripture seems to evidence that he couldn't make it. And of course, travel today is much better. But if we go look at uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 19, and those verses 
Three times we're told that the nations will come before the, before the king in Jerusalem to celebrate the, the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, or they don't get rain. That's future prophecy. That's future prophecy. If we're supposed to keep it then, why aren't we keeping it now? Just, anyway. But we're understanding what Paul did. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. We're going to take a quick trip outside of the book of Acts so that we can see something else that, um, that Paul did. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven. What do you do? If I hit one of those little links over there, it jumps. And I've got my um, five, verse seven and eight. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Messiah our Pesach is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened of sincerity and truth. And he's drawing connections straight out of the Tanakh and straight out of the Torah with regards to Passover and unleavened observance. And he's saying, let's do it, but this is what the symbols mean. This is what we're supposed to do in turn. This is what we're supposed to understand when we do it. It's not just a rote. It's not just a rote thing. Here's an example. I was walking across the... Uh, Okay, let me back up. New favorite toy, a new favorite app on here is Uversion. Y-O-U-V-E-R-S-I-O-N, one word. If you use it, look me up, Pete Rambo, friend me. It, it's, it's fun for sharing scripture, for sharing highlights, for sharing insights. Lots of different translations available to you. But one of the cool new tricks that they've got is um, being able to take a scripture, add it to an image, and then share that image. They just upgraded it such that you can take an image and now add, your, add scripture to your own image. And so two mornings ago or three mornings ago, I was walking across the, uh, I, 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 got the <laughs> I got the email. I'm so excited about this. I got the email while I'm in the office before I go out on my 540 bus run. And it said, you know, now we have the ability to add your own image. And I thought, wow, that's cool. I just have to, you know, I'll get a chance to use that eventually. Well, I'm walking across the parking lot and I see all the buses lined up with the street light shining over them and the black pavement. And oh man, I was like, I know. And I took a picture of the buses and I added a scripture verse that comes straight out of the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 24. That talks about the fact that now that we have a schoolmaster, we're no longer under, um, under the law, but we, we're, we walk with Messiah. Here's the question. When you graduate from high school, did you stop reading? When you graduate from high school, did you stop using the math skills that they taught you? When you graduated from high school or when you left home, did you stop using the manners that your parents gave you? Or driver's license. Yeah, you get your driver's license. Now you don't have to obey the rules? No. Here's the point. When you graduate from high school, there may not be somebody there beating you over the head to do your homework or to ensure that you use proper grammar. However, if you've learned the lesson properly, now it's internalized and you can take it and you can use it in life properly without suffering consequences if you mess it up. You understand what I'm saying? That's what the schoolmaster was for. That's, yes, and that's exactly the point with the Messiah. In Messiah, we continue to be obedient to the right rules of righteousness. However, there's grace there when we mess up. Willful sin will get you in trouble, right? However, when we, when, we, when we fail or when we fall short, he's there to, to pick us up, right? And that was the image looking at the school buses. My question at the top was, um, do we then nullify the law? <clears throat> Paul says, and we'll get to this, Paul says, by no means we establish the law by faith. And we'll... Man, I was way off on a tangent. But that's good stuff. It's great stuff. And understanding how all this fits together, right? Acts chapter 29, uh, 27 verse 9 is another picture here where we see Paul being obedient to the Torah. 20, 
what I say? 27 verse 9. Acts 27 verse 9. No, it should be on 27. Come on. 27 verse 9. That's another one about the fast. Yes. Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and he said unto them, yada, yada, so on and so forth. Why do we have that detail in Scripture? Well, the fast was the Feast of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. They understood that. We it's in the fall. We don't. The weather now gets rotten on the Mediterranean. You don't sail a little tiny boat across the Med in the, in the wintertime. The little piece of detail, if you don't understand the Hebraic thought, if you don't understand the reference, he's writing to, to people who understand the law. Who understand the instructions, I should say. Torah means instructions. It doesn't mean law. Thank you. Right? Yes. <laughs> that's Shepard that's Brown's uh, uh, soapbox. And it's true. It's true. Because we have a misconception of what the word law means. Right? The long arm of the law. No. No, it's God's instructions. He said, these are my instructions in righteousness. This is what you do if you want to be righteous. This is what you do if you want to please me. This is how you show me love as you be obedient to what I command, right? And right here, the little detail right here explains to us, it demonstrates to us Yom Kippur. They were, not only were they keeping it, but they're also using it as a timestamp, as a marker as they move through time. Okay? Part of the Moedim, the seasons, right? We see that. Um, Paul kept... Nazarite vows. Did you know that? We have two examples of Paul keeping a Nazarite vow in the book of Acts. Nazarite vows are explained in um, Numbers chapter 6. And um, it talks about abstention from anything of the vine and um, not cutting your hair and then bringing sacrifices to the temple to fulfill the vow, you have to bring sacrifices to the temple, right? And so here we see Paul as he's, as he's uh, traveling, it says, and he reasoned in the synagogue, uh, let's see, Acts chapter, what did I say, 18? It's 18, 18. I'm on the wrong reference here. 18, 18. And Paul tarried there yet a good while and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. Having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. He was keeping Nazarite vow. That's the scripture tells us that that's part of what part of what you do. Now we can't keep Nazarite vows today, precisely because there is no temple and there's not a priesthood in place, and so on and so forth. Okay, but it demonstrates that Paul was keeping the Torah. He was keeping the instructions of God. There's another, even more. Glaring example of this in um, verse 21. Did you miss that one in the same chapter? Said, Teach me something. But he bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you with God's will. Wow, there you go. There's another one. You missed it. I missed it. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm telling you, Acts is so full that I've been in it so many times, and here we go. I just, and uh, I'll have to look and see if I've got that. Highlighted in my Bible, and I just overlooked it yesterday. I don't have that marked in my Bible. Well, mark it in your Bible. Yes, I love that. I'll, I'll come back to that. Jeremiah, don't let me forget. I must keep the. I must keep the feast. Ah, oh, it's just a tradition, right? That's what we're told. He just did it out of tradition. No. He did it out of obedience. He knew what righteousness looks like, what righteousness does. Halakha is how you walk. It's how you act. It's what you do. It's not say. James said, show me your faith or, and I will show you my faith by my works. works. What works was he talking about? They're not undefined works. The works that he's talking about are defined in Scripture. You don't have to say, well, I don't know what a good work is. It's defined in Scripture for us over and over and over. So, very good. I like that. Thank you. Um, Acts chapter 21, and this right here is a big, important passage of Scripture for us that uh, we need to come back to for multiple other reasons as well. But Acts chapter 21... 
is the beginning. It's right before Paul winds up in prison. This is, this is or, or in chains. This is where it begins. Paul goes back to Jerusalem. He's going to keep the feast. And while he's there, he meets with, um, uh, meets with the elders so that he can give a report of what's going on among the Gentiles. And there's a problem. All of those in Jerusalem had been told that he was teaching against Moses. Okay, we've got false witnesses, and we're going to see false witnesses with a lot of different things. And they tell him, you know, they say, what do we do? And then James That's makes the recommendation. That's why they wanted to kill him. And James makes the recommendation. He says, here's what you do. Take a Nazarite vow, and you go and you fulfill the Nazarite vow as a demonstration that you yourself walk orderly according to the Torah. That's exactly what Scripture says. Let's look at that, and then we're going we're gonna to see that he keeps a Nazarite vow. And he pays for others to do it. He does. When we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly, and the following Paul went in with us unto James. Again, I tell you, that, that word right there is Jacob, Jacobus. His name was Jacob. It wasn't James. The, the name got changed to honor a king that lived in England, and they named a Bible after him, and it got nothing to do with what's in Scripture. It's Jacob. The book of James should be Yahweh, which is Jacob. That's right. It was, it was renamed That's right. because King James had a big ego. They were stroking it, too. And when he had saluted them, he declared um, particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands. The word thousands here is myriad, and one myriad is 10,000. And this is multiple myriads. So we've got tens of thousands of Jews in Jerusalem that are, there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the Torah, the law, the instructions of God. So they're believing in Messiah, and they're zealous for the Torah. And this isn't just a few odds and ends. We like to think about Jerusalem as, you know, just a couple believers trying to figure out how to make this thing happen. No. Literally, I believe that there was a point at which 30 to 50 percent of Jerusalem were followers of Messiah and keeping Torah. And this is what had the religious leaders completely up in arms because they were losing a position of power and authority. And that's why this thing had to be stopped. Because belief in, in, in Messiah, when you come to a right understanding of, of following God's ways, you also come to a right understanding that, you know what? The oral traditions are not necessary. They're not binding. They don't override what Scripture says. So we come on down. They are informed, see, they're talking about these thousands that are zealous in Jerusalem. It says, they are informed of you that you teach all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is, what is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear you, you are come. He, he's saying, they're going to hear you're here. And they have heard that, that you're teaching against Moses. Now, this would be a great opportunity for Paul to say, well, I am. That's not what he does. It's not what he says. Otherwise, he's a lying schizophrenic. He says, James tells me, he says, do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. They were waiting for him. They already had four guys that were under a Nazarite vow, ready to go. Very it says, them take and purify yourself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing. See, Paul is going to take a Nazarite vow and he's going to go into the temple and he's going to offer sacrifice and he's going to pay for four other guys to do it so that he can prove to the world that it is a lie that he teaches against Moses. And how much did it cost? That was very expensive. It was because, I mean, I mean you're, you're talking about multiple animals that are going to be sacrificed and all the other pieces, parts that go with this. Here's the point, though. Is Paul lying? Is he going to say, well, okay, we're going to, I'm going to save my skin 
and I am teaching against Moses, but I'm willing to go in there and tell everybody I'm not, and I'm going to pay all of this. He's, but right here says, but you yourself also walk orderly and keep the Torah. There are only two options here. Either Paul was a, a colossal liar when he went to offer this sacrifice before God, or he's telling the truth. Now you tell me which he's doing. If he's a liar, we may as well take that portion of, the, of Scripture, rip the whole, you know, what, 19 books or something that he's, he's connected with, or 13 books, rip them all out and toss them in the trash can because they're not worth anything. You can't trust any of them. Or if he's telling the truth, we need to stop and ponder and go back and understand what is it that he actually said because we have evidence right here. What you do speaks so loud I can hardly hear what you say. What he did was he kept the Torah over and over and over. We've got more examples right here. Right. I mean, just was so different. Absolutely. And what, what we see is that we see um, him stepping away from the traditions of man and walking. Which is what Yeshua, walking, taught. Which is what Yeshua taught. Yeshua taught over and over that, that the tradition of men is what you had to guard against. And instead, walk in the ways of the Father, the simple ways of the Father. It's not complicated at all. So, as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing as save only that they keep themselves from offered to idols and from blood and from strangled, strangled and from fornication. He's, he's referring back to this letter that went out and he's reminding everybody that's there that, you know, we did address the fact that the Gentiles are supposed to be learning Moses in the synagogue on the Sabbath. That initially they need to put aside the pagan practices connected with pagan sacrifice in the temples that involved strangulation and fornication. There were temple prostitutes and um, dealt with uh, the drinking of blood. It was a common thing in pagan tradition and pagan practices. And he's saying, we're telling them, don't do that because it's, all, it, it's violently against the Torah. And when you don't do that, you are now clean enough to come into the synagogue and begin to learn the rest of what the Father teaches us. It was like the table. Yes. Able, yeah. Yes, to just sit down and start. Sure. It was a, it was a start. And so it says, then Paul, here's the evidence right here. Then Paul took the men and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. This is almost 20 years after Messiah's resurrection. And Paul is in the temple Offering sacrifices. So what that ought to rattle a whole lot of theology. Yeah. What in the world is Paul doing in the temple offering sacrifice? Of course, if you go back and read the book of Ezekiel, it tells us that when the Messiah returns and the, and the temple is rebuilt, there will be sacrifices, blood sacrifices. The fat and the blood will be offered. Ezekiel chapter 43 and 44. Wrestle with it. We're told exactly the same thing in Isaiah chapter, um, uh, not uh, in Zechariah chapter fourteen, verse twenty-one. When we go up for the feast of booths, there will be sacrifices offered. Wrestle with it. You're scratching your head. <laughs> seriously though, seriously though, that's something, and 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 maybe we'll get a chance to tackle that. The point being is. Let me give you a snapshot, just a little picture real quick. Today is my brother's birthday. He's celebrating something that already took place. But he's having a remembrance. In fact, we're told right from the beginning that Passover is a remembrance. It's a memorial looking back to an event that's already been accomplished. We're told in the book of Hebrews that no sacrifice ever saved anyone. It was a remembrance looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. And sacrifice afterwards is a remembrance looking back to the Messiah. Now, just to throw something else out there and then we're going to move on. But I'll throw something else out there. How many of y'all had a steak for dinner last night? No hands? How many of y'all had meat on your plate last night? 
Okay? Something had to die for that meat to wind up on your plate. And yet we denigrate sacrifice. Why? Need to think about that one. You got to wrestle with that. Because I'm telling you, in the millennial kingdom, Scripture tells us the millennial kingdom will have sacrifice. What was Paul doing 20 years after the Messiah in the temple offering sacrifice? The sacrifice reminds us that sin is costly. I did not stand at the foot of the cross and see my Messiah die. But as a little homesteader, we raise animals, and I love those animals. But you know what? Sometimes those animals wind up on the table. And it's not an easy thing to do. Every time that we butcher something, we are reminded that it costs. And every time a sacrifice is made, it reminds us that it cost him something. And if we have to pay for that sacrifice, it costs us something. You understand what I'm saying? <coughs> that, that, this passage of Scripture right here will rattle Christian doctrine in so many different ways, but we have to wrestle with it. What does Scripture say? Okay, moving on. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. So what was Paul's testimony about himself? He, he, he was arrested. He was arrested here. This is where it began. He was arrested in the temple. And they arrested him not because he was offering sacrifices. They arrested him because allegedly, and we will see over and over that false witnesses are involved in everything that happens in his accusations. Allegedly, he had brought a Gentile into the, the temple with him. There was no evidence that he had done that. None is provided. It was just like Yeshua when they lied about him. And Stephen when they lied about him. Um, in fact, the, the lie against Stephen was that he was telling people that Yeshua did away with um, Moses and the temple. And yet... It says right in Scripture that they had to use false witnesses because the, a, a true witness wouldn't have said that. Okay. Um, Acts chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. He's been arrested. And he's standing in front of, uh, he's standing in front, beginning his defense right there in front of the crowd. He asks, can I talk to the crowd? He says, men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spoke in Hebrew, and he kept, uh, and they kept more silence, and he said, I am verily a man, a Jew, born in Tarsus, in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city, Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the perfect manner of the Torah, of the fathers, and was zealous toward God. Okay? So he, his, he begins his defense by telling them, <coughs> excuse me, by telling them how he had been taught. Earnestly beholding the council, he's standing in front of the Sanhedrin. They've taken him in under guard. And he says, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God. What constitutes a good conscience before God? Righteous living. What constitutes righteous living according to what his accusers say, and according to what he'd been taught, obedience to the instructions of God, the Torah, until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, uh, you whitewashed wall, for sittest you uh, to judge me after the Torah, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the Torah. He understands the Torah is the standard. Right? But he apologized. He does. Apparently he wasn't dressed in whatever the garb was. Uh, they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? And Paul says, I was, not, uh, I was not, brethren, that he, or I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. What did Yeshua always quote? The Torah. What does Paul quote? The Torah. In fact, the New Testament, uh, the quotes... In fact, almost one-third of Paul's writings are direct quotes from the, the Tanakh or teachings that stem from the Tanakh where he is, he's expounding on and leading you back to the instructions and righteousness that come from all Scripture that was a, a, already given. And 90% of Revelation. Yes, 90% of Revelation comes straight out of 
When Paul perceived that uh, one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out to the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Notice he doesn't say, I was a Pharisee. He says, I am a Pharisee. Now, we are going to stop right there, and we'll pick up right there next week. Um, because the next couple... I would recommend reading Acts 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28, and consider, look at, figure out what Paul's testimony is of himself. There are passages in every single one of those where he says, I did this, and his testimony of himself, and consider what he did. Look at it, and that's what we'll go back and look at, but we're particularly going to look at an interesting word that appears in Scripture that gets misused today, the Greek word heresis. Anybody have any idea what that word is today? Heresy or heretic. And we misuse it today. It's not, we don't use it the way it's used in Scripture. And so we'll take a look at that. If you've got, if you've got e-sword, look it up and see how it's translated. Okay? All right. We're going we're gonna to wrap up right here. Let me, uh, let me close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you particularly for your instruction in righteousness, and we thank you for the example we have in Paul and what he did. And Father, we ask that you would work in us, that you would open our eyes, that you would um, help us to understand the fullness of what your word means, and particularly understand what he taught, how he is to rightly be understood, so that we can see uh, your word connected in fullness and glory as all of it is, is tied from beginning to end. It's one message for one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body. And uh, we just thank you for that. Uh, we ask that you go with us this week, that you would instruct us, that you would guard our hearts, but that you would also challenge us to consider deeply your ways and what it means to walk according to the way the Messiah walked. And we pray this, Meshem Yeshua Meshikanu, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen.